Okay, before we uh, move on to the next item of business, a debate marking one year of war against Ukraine, I'm sure colleagues will wish to join me in welcoming Mr Andrei Kuzli, Consul of Ukraine in Edinburgh. Thank you. And the next item of business is the debate on motion 7998 in the name of Neil Gray on marking one year of war against Ukraine. I would invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Neil Gray to speak to and move the motion. Minister, for around 12 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, can I join you in welcoming my friend Andrew Cousley uh, to the gallery? It's a pleasure to have you here to be able to hear the solidarity that this Parliament has with the people of Ukraine. I move the motion in my name on Russia's illegal war against Ukraine. It's now almost a year since Russian troops swarmed across Ukraine's borders in what was a brutal, unprovoked invasion against a peaceful neighbour. Today gives us the opportunity to stand together, united, as we pause and reflect on the impact the past year has had on the people of Ukraine, including the brave soldiers who continue to fight daily for their country, their people, their culture and heritage, those who have sadly lost their lives in the conflict and those who have had to leave their homes and flee to other countries to find sanctuary. The Scottish Government has repeatedly condemned Russia's unprovoked and illegal war against Ukraine, which stretches back to the invasion of Crimea in 2014. More broadly, we continue to stand for democracy, human rights and the rule of law at home and abroad and reject wholeheartedly the premise that Russia was somehow provoked into its latest aggression by the democratic decisions made by sovereign nations in Central Europe to join NATO. Putin's propaganda does not cover up the fact that his army has invaded a member state of the United Nations. As the United Nations General Secretary said on the 24th of February last year, Russia's actions conflict directly with the United Nations Charter. Everyone in Scotland and the international community is appalled by the atrocities inflicted upon the people of Ukraine day after day, intentionally directing missile attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure constitutes war crimes. The Scottish Government agrees that those responsible for atrocities committed in Ukraine, including military commanders and others, individuals in the Putin regime, must be held accountable. The courage shown by the people of Ukraine has been extraordinary, and Ukraine's armed forces have shown that if they are given the tools to do the job, they can defeat Russia. However, in praising Ukraine's armed forces for their bravery and successes, we cannot become complacent. Russia is not giving up in its aim to take as much Ukrainian territory as possible. As we have seen with the fighting intensifying along much of the east of the front in recent weeks. An insight into the warped mind of those prosecuting this war against Ukraine was provided when the leader of the shady Wagner group, Yegeny Progizhin, recently said, the meat grinder is working. Referring to the fierce battles around Bakhmut, this chilling comment shows that the Russian leadership is not only content to see large numbers of its troops perish on the battlefield, but indeed their deaths are part of the strategy. And in his State of the Nation address earlier this week, Putin laid bare the rambling depravity of his worldview. One person is responsible for the invasion of Ukraine, and that is Putin himself. We condemn his announcement to suspend Russia's participation in the New START Treaty. There is no justification for using the threat of nuclear weapons. Now, during his visit to Kyiv on Monday, President Biden said that Putin believed Ukraine to be weak and the West was divided, that he counted on NATO not maintaining unity and th thought he would outlast us. The international community has shown great resolve in maintaining its support for Ukraine, as we have seen with support for displaced Ukrainians across Europe, ever tightening sanctions and the increasing quantity and sophistication of military aid. But again, we cannot take this for granted. It is now vital that the international community provides further support for Ukraine. That is essential both for Ukraine itself and for longer-term peace and stability in Europe. And I would like to 
emphasise Scotland's continued support for all those affected. The Scottish Government has provided £4 million in financial aid to help provide basic humanitarian assistance, including in health, water and sanitation, and shelter for those fleeing Ukraine. The Scottish Government has so far sent five consignments of medical supplies to Poland for onward shipment and transport to Ukraine, totalling 156 pallets worth almost £3 million. We have also committed £300,000 to the Halo Trust, a Dumfries and Galloway-based charity who specialise in removing landmines and other dangerous explosive devices. Today, I am pleased to announce to Parliament that we will provide an additional £1 million in funding to be allocated between the British Red Cross, Christian Aid and SCIAF, organisations we all know are key in providing much-needed humanitarian aid and support to the people of Ukraine. <laughs> Presiding officer, this week the First Minister wrote an open letter to Ukrainians both in Scotland and around the world, condemning Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. The letter highlights the extraordinary resilience shown by the Ukrainian people and makes it clear that they are welcome here in Scotland for as long as they want to be here. The international solidarity with Ukraine among democratic nations has, of course, only been strengthened by the outpouring of generosity and compassion by people across the world who have welcomed those displaced by the war in Ukraine into their communities and into their homes. Since the conflict began, over 23,000 people with a Scottish sponsor have arrived in the UK. That is the equivalent of welcoming the population of our broth to resettle here and represents around 20 per cent, a fifth of all UK arrivals, the most per head of any of the four nations of the UK. Of course. Alex Cole Hamilton. I am very grateful indeed for the Minister giving way and I congratulate the Scottish Government on bringing so many Ukrainians here. Um, one slight problem with that is that at this time only 18% of those who have arrived on our shores seeking safe harbour have achieved any kind of long-term accommodation. Um, the Minister will be aware of my uh, call to extend the free discretionary bus travel scheme to refugees of, on all schemes who are finding safe harbour in Scotland so that they might take up opportunities of accommodation beyond the central belt. Minister. I thank uh, Alec Cole Hamilton uh, for his question and, and pay tribute to him for his own uh, involvement and, and steadfast support for the people of Ukraine uh, here in Scotland. We are looking at all we can do in terms of concessionary travel and support there and indeed the accommodation uh, that we can provide through the £50 million long-term resettlement fund that allows properties to be brought back into use, 750 that have already done so and more projects in the pipeline. Over 19,000 of the arrivals in Scotland have been through the Scottish Government's own success super sponsor scheme. When we compare the numbers to other schemes like the Syrian resettlement scheme uh, where we welcome 3,000 arrivals over a period of five years, we can appreciate the scale of the current challenge and the Herculean effort of all our key partners in ensuring displaced people receive a warm Scottish welcome. Uh, we have been assisted in welcoming vast numbers to our country by the Consular Corps staff from Ukraine uh, and also from those from Poland, Romania and many other countries. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Andrew Kusli and Yevhen Mankowski for working with us over the past year. I am hugely grateful to them for their expertise they have shared on issues such as schooling, housing, culture and community integration. Their input has been invaluable to our response. Officer, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank all those who have opened their homes and welcomed displaced people from Ukraine into their families. You have acted in kindness and in recognition of a shared humanity with our friends from Ukraine. It is our shared mission to ensure that our friends from Ukraine can call Scotland their home for as long as they need it to be, and we are seeking to ensure access to sustainable, longer-term accommodation for displaced people. When the war broke out, we acted swiftly to ensure that welcome accommodation was available. As well as mobilising hotels, we chartered two passenger ships to temporarily house arrivals from Ukraine. This provided a safe place at pace in time of need for large numbers of people fleeing war, but it was also always our intention that these measures would and should be temporary. In September, we launched our Ukraine Long-Term Resettlement Fund with up to £50 million available to bring council and, and RSL empty properties back into use and increase housing supply. The homes provided will be good, affordable, quality homes and will be available for rent for up to three years, after which some will continue to be available as social rented homes. 
Work is already underway in Aberdeen, Glasgow, North Lanarkshire and North Ayrshire to bring over 750 void properties into use for the benefit of displaced people. And I visited the homes in North Lanarkshire and was delighted to see the efforts that have been implemented to ensure that displaced people have a suitable home to live in whilst they're here in Scotland and the support from the community to be here as well. The Scottish Government has provided significant funding of around £200 million over the past year and is set to invest over £70 million next year to ensure that those displaced by the illegal war in Ukraine are supported to rebuild their lives in our communities. However, our commitments need to be matched by the UK Government, with UK funding set to fall from £10,500 to £5,900 for those arriving after 1 January this year. We would urge the UK Government to do more to support displaced Ukrainians across the UK. Presiding officer, it is clear there is a wealth of activity to help displaced people from Ukraine settle well across the country. This would not have been possible without the continued help, support and collaboration of our local authority partners, COSLA, the third sector organisations and volunteers. The truth is that fully integrating people uh, displaced from Ukraine into our society goes beyond securing a visa and finding accommodation. It is a commitment to ensure that those from Ukraine can enjoy the same rights and the same opportunities as those living in Scotland. Local authorities, third sector organisations and volunteers have been instrumental in providing displaced people with support and advice to help them access a wide array of services and opportunities. Unfortunately, I don't have time to thank each and every organisation for their valued contributions, but please be assured the important contributions you have made and continue to be made are felt up and down the country, and you are literally changing lives, presiding officer. I would also like to thank those Ukrainians who have decided to make Scotland their temporary home. They're making a fantastic contribution to the communities that they are becoming an integral part of. They, are, they bring diversity in skills, culture and diversity, which we welcome with open arms. Many of our guests have taken up employment and are settling well into communities across Scotland. We're also seeing children and young adults settling well into schools, colleges and universities across the country. So, presiding officer, to conclude, as we solemnly recognise that a year has passed since the illegal invasion of Ukraine, we all hope that Ukraine will soon have peace restored. Our message remains one of strong support and solidarity, and I'd like to thank and close by saying once again to the Ukrainian community here in Scotland, you are welcome here for as long as you choose to make Scotland your home. Finally, on, on Tuesday night, uh, the presiding officer and I hosted the Postcards for Ukraine event uh, here in Parliament. There were a number of powerful speeches from that evening, but what struck with me and sticks with me still is the words of Artem, an injured soldier from Ukraine who is retreat, receiving treatment here in Scotland. He said, may your hearts never give up on Ukraine. Presiding officer, our hearts will never give up. The people of Scotland, this Government, this Parliament will always hold Ukraine in our hearts and we will always show solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I now call on Donald Cameron for around eight minutes, Mr. Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and can I associate these benches uh, with the welcome to the Consul for Ukraine? Um, on a visit a few months ago to the MS Victoria ship docked in Leith, where hundreds of Ukrainians are currently being housed, uh, I saw something that I have to say has left a, an indelible mark on me. There was a gallery of pictures drawn by the many children uh, living on that boat, and one of them caught my attention. And it was a picture of Ukraine, and written above the picture it said, I will go home. And it reveals so much, not just the honesty and defiance that sometimes children express better than adults, but perhaps more pertinently, the fact that Ukrainians in Scotland don't see themselves here permanently. They don't like to be called refugees, and that's because they're not. We are simply a staging post before they return home. And that's why it's so important that today of all days, we stand together as a parliament in solidarity with people in Ukraine and of Ukraine. And we will, of course, be supporting the motion in the name of Neil Gray, 
this evening and can I associate these benches with his remarks and also thank him personally for his ongoing efforts in keeping opposition MSPs updated on what the government is doing to support Ukrainians who are living in Scotland and on its wider work on this important issue. It's vital, uh, presiding officer, we have this debate today to make it clear that Scotland stands with the Ukraine during this conflict and the, the slings and arrows of domestic politics, the cut and thrust of everyday debate in this chamber. None of that matters today. The Scottish Parliament will, like parliaments around the world, send a message of hope to Ukraine and a robust rejection of Russia's illegal war as of tomorrow, a year old. The yes. Okay, uh, thank you to Mr Cameron for accepting intervention. Does the, the member agree that one of the issues that's facing Ukraine is the fact that they're being given enough weapons to hold off the Russians, but they're not being given enough weapons to defeat the Russians? And if this war isn't going to continue year on, year out, with all the difficulties that's going to cause for, for Ukraine, they should be given the weapons to defeat Russia and fully liberate their territory. Donald Cameron. I, I agree with the, the broad thrust of uh, Kenna Gibson's comment, and I note what the UK government, amongst other uh, governments across the world, have done in that regard. Um, I would like to concentrate these comments today on, on the solidarity that we, we have with our Ukrainian friends and restate some, some truths, uh, as Neil Gray has just done. We deplore the illegal invasion of Ukraine by the Putin regime. We condemn the horrific attacks on innocent civilians that have occurred during this last year. We share the revulsion that many have expressed and continue to express about this uh, provocative, callous action and the violent horror it has unleashed. We support the international efforts to supply Ukraine with military assistance and humanitarian aid. We support the sanctions imposed on Russia by the international community and we recognise the efforts of both the Scottish Government and the UK Government to welcome Ukrainians fleeing the war to make their home here for the time being. Uh, let me explore a few of the issues in, in a bit more detail because the rapid response of both our governments to this crisis has been very impressive. Whether that be through the uh, UK-wide Homes for Ukraine scheme or the Scotland's super sponsor scheme, we have ensured that many Ukrainians can come to our country for as long as necessary. And I don't want to stray too far from the consensual nature of this debate, but one of the concerns that we will raise, because it exists, is around housing uh, and the fact that uh, work is needed, in particular around longer-term accommodation for Ukrainians living and working in Scotland. And the Red Cross has stated that uh, there has been minimal support available for displaced Ukrainians to access uh, other forms of accommodation if, for instance, rematching isn't successful or if they want a longer-term housing solution. And, and I accept that the Scottish Government has recognised that and established the resettlement fund re referenced by Neil Gray in his comments. Uh, but there are concerns that uh, that may only be available to some uh, and not others, and I hope uh, he can address that perhaps in closing. Yep. Minister. I, I thank uh, Donald Cameron, uh, first of all, for his, his, his remarks uh, uh, around uh, our support and uh, the UK government's support for the people of Ukraine uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the British Red Cross, we are working with them on the concerns that they uh, have raised, and uh, we are working very closely on how we can make sure that we are responding to what they have said. Uh, but I just want to reiterate on the longer-term resettlement fund that the opportunity is there for all local authorities to come forward with proposals for where they can repurpose buildings, where they can bring void properties back into use. That is going to be a major contribution to ensuring that people have longer-term resettlement options uh, here in Scotland. And I would encourage uh, him, his colleagues, all those around Parliament to uh, speak to the local authorities about potential opportunities that might be open. Donald Cameron, I can give you the time back. Th thank you for that. Um, I'm grateful to, to the Minister for clarifying that. Um, on the subject of aid, uh, the significant aid contributions of both governments to help those who remain in Ukraine is noteworthy. In total, the UK has so far contributed £220 million worth of humanitarian aid to Ukraine. And similarly, we welcome the £4 million of humanitarian aid from the Scottish Government, as well as the additional uh, £1 million just uh, mentioned today, as part of a wider effort. Um, sanctions, of course, have been in place against Russia since 2014, uh, following its uh, unlawful annexation of Crimea. Um, and the UK government uh, rightly, in my view, legislated to establish 
an unprecedented package of sanctions. As of last week, some, uh, I think, 1,471 Russian individuals, 169 entities are subject to UK sanctions. Uh, in addition to this, uh, we have sanctioned banks, Russian banks, defence sector organisations, uh, and banned uh, Russian vessels from UK ports and Russian aircraft from flying uh, or landing in the UK. And it's right and proper that this continues in the, at home and abroad, uh, including the, in the EU, which has acted with impressive haste on sanctions, that we continue to identify economic measures that exert pressure on Russia to end this war. And it's hard to um, think that a year has gone past since Russia invaded. It seems a much shorter time than that. But for those Ukrainians affected, it probably seems much, much longer. And even though a year has elapsed, we are as steadfast in our resolve and as sincere in our support for Ukraine as we were a year ago. And in Scotland, there has been an heroic response from the public, from those who volunteered to help with organising aid to Ukraine, to those who have raised funds, to those who have opened their homes and welcomed Ukrainians into their families. Yes, there have been challenges, we know. Visas, housing, schools, health, jobs. None of it simple to organise, all of it crucial. But Scotland has risen to the occasion and we will continue to do so until there is a peaceful resolution to this unjustified conflict. How lucky we are. We go about life normally. We have that freedom. But in Ukraine, they don't. We can never forget that. There they live in fear every day. Many have no electricity. Many are separated from their families. Many, when they wake up, the first thing they will do is check the news to see whether bombs have hit, which towns and cities have been targeted, whether their families are safe. And sometimes, tragically, some do not wake up at all. And the stark, terrible reality is that on our own continent, war still rages. And with that war, all that goes with it, the terror and trauma, the wounded, the dying, the sorrow, the grief. Let me end on an optimistic note. There is always hope. What does Seamus Heaney write? History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. There is always hope. We will help you win this war. Ukraine, we stand with you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. I now call on Sarah Boyack for around six minutes. Ms Boyack. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, and can I refer members to my register of interests? I also want to speak in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. It is indeed rare that all of us will support a Scottish Government motion without proposing an amendment to it. That is significant because as a democratic institution, we do not always agree on everything. Let us just put it like that. But on the 24th of February, 2022, Putin's Russian forces launched an invasion of Ukraine. And there are not words to describe the shock, the anger, the deep sadness, as Ukrainians suffered and are suffering the consequences of a cruel, unjustifiable attack. And the whole world witnessed it. And I also want to put my welcome on the record to the Ukrainian Consul for us today and for being able to join us in this debate. As Sir Keir Starmer said on his recent visit to Kyiv, the UK's support for Ukraine is not party political and the Labour government would continue support for Ukraine. And I also think it's true to say that Russia could end this war today by withdrawing their troops, but until then, we, and Ukraine's democratic allies must continue to support Ukraine as they defend their sovereign territory. That is absolutely crucial. And this is not our only discussion in Parliament this week. We have had several events. We've had the incredibly emotional postcards from Ukraine celebration, which was heartening to hear the choir. Um, it was emotional. It's difficult to pass that on. We also had um, a meeting 
um, a roundtable on the risks of mitigating human trafficking amongst Ukrainian refugees. That's something that we've not discussed today, but we need to acknowledge that vulnerable people who escape the horrors of war are potentially now faced with the risks of trafficking, exploitation and abuse. And the United Nations High Commissioner spoke about the need to support women and children as they constitute the overwhelming majority of those who have fled Ukraine for neighbouring countries. Vulnerable people who have escaped the horrors of war and are now faced with the risks of trafficking, exploitation and abuse. So, as colleagues have said, um, it's very rare when I stand up to agree with Neil Gray and everything he has said. That's probably a first, maybe a last. And Donald Cameron as well, possibly a first and last. But it is that principle of standing in solidarity. And the war in Ukraine has enabled us to show our compassion and humanity as an international community. And in Scotland, I'm proud of the thousands of people who have become host to Ukrainian, the people who volunteered or donated to charities, to organisations that are supporting people in Ukraine and our local authorities. Last year we saw the representatives from the magnificent Medicines to Ukraine campaign. They briefed our MSPs, their work is impressive. They continue sourcing the logistics and the safe delivery of specialist medicines to where it is most needed by Ukrainians who are experiencing health as a result of Putin's invasion. And I also want to thank the Disasters Emergency Committee and all those across the UK who have given generous donations for their fantastic work because they are delivering support to people on the front line. And I do also welcome the Minister's announcement of additional funding today. This is an unfolding crisis and Scotland has a key role to play. And there are still thousands of people who actually hold a visa who may indeed still come to Scotland and there are people arriving from Ukraine every day. So we're a democracy, so I'm allowed to ask our government to go a bit further, to go a bit faster and to do more. That's one of the privileges of being in an elected democracy. You can say what you think without consequence. You don't have to worry about being locked up. You don't have to worry about a journalist reporting you being put into jail. So let me use my voice today. There's a bit more that we could be doing. When we had the presentation from uh, Ukrainian consul at our KIAC committee the other week, we got some incredibly helpful feedback from the front line in Scotland. The things we could be doing better on, more support for Ukrainian displaced people, particularly in relation to English language classes, childcare support, um, really provoking us to think about the challenge, the the vulnerability that people who have come from Ukraine feel, particularly thinking about people who have now got jobs, children who are now in our schools, but are potentially not in long-term permanent accommodation, even if it's for three years. So there is more that we can be doing to support our local authorities and the third sector organisations who have really stepped up to the plate in recent months. It's something that I think we can be utterly proud of. I would just like us to do more. I think we need more long-term and particularly medium-term planning to support Ukrainians who have come to Scotland. And while I very much welcome the 750 available houses that have been referred to by the Minister today, I would like to see the whole of that £50 million fund spent. I'd like to see it spent across Scotland, and particularly as a Lothian's MSP, we do have a housing crisis on top of a housing crisis. So I'm very keen to see that that investment comes forward as soon as possible. Because there are still people living in temporary accommodation, and we need to do much more to support them. And it's not just an issue for my own area, from Edinburgh and the Lothians, but it's an issue across Scotland. Um, and I know, talking to colleagues in Glasgow, that they are quite nervous about what happens next for people leaving that cruise ferry. So there is so much more that we can do. But we need to make sure that we step up to the mark, because Putin's in the illegal invasion of Ukraine has left key areas of infrastructure in Ukraine absolutely decimated. So we know that those Ukrainians who have come to Scotland need our support for the long run. We need to think at our UK and Scottish level, how can we plan and build long-term commercial links with Ukraine to ensure that reconstruction efforts are successful and they're sustainable? There is going to be so much more that we can do. So our warm welcome has got to be backed up with actions. But as I said at the start of my contribution, we are here to stand together in solidarity.
And our focus has to be clear that we are here because of Putin's actions. Yesterday we had another important debate on the need for a special tribunal to hold Putin and those who have launched aggression on the people of Ukraine for accountability, to hold them to account on the estimated 65,000 registered incidents of war crimes. It was an emotional debate, but it was also an important one. So we need to continue to support Ukrainians and defend its identity and its integrity. That means stepping up and making sure that sanctions are effectively implemented and that we send a clear message of solidarity and support today. I do want our UK and Scottish governments to do more, to spend more, to give that practical daily support to Ukrainians who have come here. You do but need to in conclude, this Parliament, Ms. although we don't agree on many things, let us agree on this motion today and let us all wish a speedy and peaceful resolution to the war that ensures Ukrainian sovereignty, democracy, independence and territorial integrity within its internationally recognised borders. Let's do that together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyack. I now call Alex Cole Hamilton for around six minutes. Mr. Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise to offer the full throated support of Scottish Liberal Democrats uh, to the Government motion today, and I offer our welcome and thanks to the Consul of Ukraine. Um, I also remind the Chamber of my register of interest that I am a host under the Homes for Ukraine scheme, and it is on that point, Presiding Officer, that I commence uh, my remarks because uh, six months ago my family opened our home to a U Ukrainian design graduate. Um, she was born in Mariupol, but grew up in Donetsk. Um, she actually had to flee her home nine years ago when Russia invaded uh, her town and destroyed her home. And she has been a refugee um, in other parts of Ukraine ever since, until the bombs started falling a year ago, and she, she and her family realized it was too late, and they had to move. It, that experience has been amazing. She is with us still, and we will, I hope, be with us for some time to come. It has enriched our lives in many ways. She has joined us at many family events. In the evenings, she sometimes reads to us the uh, messages from uh, Sasha in particular, her cousin, who is on the Eastern Front and uh, is actually right now deployed in a forward position around the defense of Bakhmut. And every, anyone who is following the war will know that that is the worst place on the planet to be right now. On the weekends, she joins other Ukrainians in church halls in Edinburgh to use brown and green and white old clothes to manufacture camouflage netting, again, to send to her relatives on the Eastern Front. And it is examples like this that remind in visceral clarity just how easy we have it here and how close and how near that the privations of, of war for the people of Ukraine are. And they aren't just the front line for their territorial integrity or winning their freedom or securing their freedom for Putin. They are the front line for the free democracies of the West and they deserve our thanks. Presiding officer, on the 24th of February, our world shifted on its axis. Russian soldiers, tanks and instruments of war crossed the border and rolled into the sovereign territory of Ukraine. That day, newspapers carried headlines that we hoped we would never see again, war in Europe. Vladimir Putin has torn up the fabric of global security. He has sanctioned unimaginable atrocities and shattered the long peace that we had all enjoyed. He doesn't belong in the Kremlin. He belongs in The Hague on indictment for war crimes. As the invasion commenced, the world watched on with bated breath. Observers and politicians alike, including Putin himself, predicted the imminent fall of Ukraine. Presiding officer, a year on and Ukraine is still standing. Because there is something that Putin, and to an extent the entire world, underestimated, and that is the resolve of Ukrainian spirit and its people's defiance. After war broke out, the day after war broke out, President Zelensky offered a stark warning to Ukraine's invaders. He told them, when you attack us, you will not see our backs. You will, not, you will see our faces. This is, I think, the perfect encapsulation of Ukrainian resistance. Even so, the effects of war have been deadly on Ukraine. The UN have estimated the conflict is responsible for 18,000 casualties, civilian casualties, over 7,000 deaths. Last September, the war hit another grim milestone with 1,000 children becoming casualties of war, more than nearly 500 of them having died. And one of those children was an eight-year-old boy known as Sasha. According to his parents, he was a very good boy, always helpful and loving to his younger siblings. In the same week the UN announced those statistics, Sasha was killed in a shelling attack at his home in southern Ukraine. Speaking to a journalist, his father said, I wish they could take me, not my kid. 
This is just one example of the devastation that has taken place over the last year, and it is only right, presiding officer, that just as we are doing now, we take time to commemorate and remember those lives lost. It was Martin Luther King who said that injustice everywhere, is anywhere, is a threat to justice everywhere. This war may have been an injustice to the people of Ukraine, but it is a threat to the peace and democracy of the world. It is therefore our duty as global citizens to do all that we can, and I am proud to say that Scotland has been doing its part. More than 20,000 refugees have arrived in Scotland within the last year, and the people of Scotland have opened their homes and their hearts to the Ukrainian people. In my constituency, Volunteer Edinburgh have done an incredible job at meeting displaced Ukrainians arriving at the airport and have coordinated donations, learning centres, onward travel to the Ukrainian reception hub, also at Gogo in my constituency. However, we must remember there is more that we can do and we should be doing. We've heard some of that today. Ref uh, figures released today show that just 6,200 Ukrainians are still in temporary accommodations. They need to know what comes next once their short-term placements end. And they can't be allowed to live, with their hand, uh, live their lives in constant limbo, worried about what comes next. The government could help today by extending, as I asked in my intervention to the minister, the free bus pass scheme to include refugees on all schemes, whether they're from Ukraine or Syria or Afghanistan. They could provide comprehensive language support and identify the skills of those arriving to help match people with a job opportunity so they can make a long-term home here if they so wish. Presiding officer, the vibrant stripes of blue and yellow have been emblazoned into the minds and the hearts of people around the world this past year. Those colors within the Ukrainian flag represent the industry of its people because it symbolizes blue skies over cornfields, golden wheat fields. However, that flag also harbors a deeper meaning freedom above bread. This anniversary, the world comes together to remember everything that has been lost. But we also hope that one day soon, that Ukraine will enjoy its blue skies of freedom once more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole Hamilton. We now move to the open debate. I call first Fiona Hislop to be followed by Annie Wells around six minutes, Ms. Hislop. Presiding officer, I, I too pay tribute to all those who have been injured and killed in this year since the Russian illegal invasion of sovereign UK Ukraine and stand in solidarity with Ukrainians, both those who remain in Ukraine and those who have been forced to flee their homeland. I too am on the banned and sanction list from Russia, but such is the state of their intelligence, they hadn't realised I ceased to be a, a government minister in May 2021. But I have been insistent and consistent in my resistance to Russia. Yes, the full-scale invasion, invasion started a year ago, but the invasion and annexation of Russia of, uh, by Russia of, Ukraine, of, of Crimea took place in 2014. And as then minister, I refused diplomatic access by the Russian consulate here in Edinburgh from 2014 right through to 2021. I want to focus today on the issues of rights of humanity in this war, the collective European response and longer term resilience issues. Mahatma Gandhi said, a nation's culture resides in the hearts and in the soul of its people. And these words are true of the people of Ukraine. But in a very eloquent speech last night on the need for a tribunal on Russia's war crimes against humanity, Jenny Minto reminded us that in times of war, aggressors deliberately destroy culture and cultural assets to destroy the soul of a people and erase them from the memory and the mind of the world. And in an article published in The Guardian in December 22, Ukrainian Culture Minister Alexandra Tachenko warned that Russia is trying to destroy the Ukrainians' culture. The Ministry of Culture and Information Policy in Ukraine have reported that Russian forces have severely damaged or destroyed around 1,500 objects of cultural heritage and infrastructure. Ukrainian cultural leaders spoke of this at the Edinburgh International Culture Summit held here last year. And I would urge the Scottish Government to do what we can to support the culture, the soul of the people of Ukraine. Conflict is not limited to physical attacks and the impacts of this on war on women and girls make this clear. UN women have reported that food insecurity among women-led households in Ukraine has increased. Many school-aged girls have been forced to drop out of school and instances of gender-based violence have increased. 
So despite these harsh challenges, women have also been central to the war effort, with women making up 22% of the Ukrainian armed forces, with some fighting on the front lines. Women also play an important role in protecting families fleeing the fighting. And First Lady Olina Zelenska has launched a foundation which focuses on rebuilding the human capital of Ukraine and working to help the people of Ukraine build a future in their native country. The people of Ukraine have shown immense strength in the face of this attack on their country. But they need the world not to just condemn Russia, but to prosecute. Last week, while speaking at the Munich Security Conference, US Vice President Kamala Harris announced the United Nations formal determination that Russia has committed crimes against humanity. In September 22, the UN appointed independent human rights investigators found that war, war crimes had been committed in this conflict. Evidence was reported of some of the most heinous acts, including executions, torture and sexual violence. And only last week, members of the European Parliament, in cooperation with Ukraine and the international community, pushed for that creation of a special international tribunal to prosecute Russian leadership. So it is no longer enough to condemn. We must act as one international community to hold Russia to account for the awful crimes they have committed during this war. And I recognise the swift actions of the UK government in providing military equipment. Over the course of this conflict, what has been remarkable, though, is that united and unwavering show of support from the European Union and NATO to the people of Ukraine, which Putin did not anticipate and had calculated in a strategic blunder that they would divide and let him have a swift victory. Military diplomacy by Europe has never been easy, and however awkward it can seem, it is working. But we will need to go further. Internationally, we have seen sanctions against Russia, humanitarian and military support, and a commitment to support refugees fleeing the war. And the importance of this united, strong and clear support for Ukraine was powerfully recognised by President Zelensky in his address to EU leaders in Brussels this month. At this address, European Parliament President Roberta Mitsola said to President Zelensky, we understand that you are fighting not only for your values, but for ours. And the war in Ukraine has also highlighted the need for many in Europe to end reliance on Russian fossil fuels. The Versailles Declaration of March 2022 marked the agreement of EU leaders to phase out EU's dependence on Russian fossil fuels as soon as possible. Since then, the EU has imposed a ban on Russian crude oil and petroleum products. Going forward, longer term, Scotland has a role. And for many years, I advised EU capitals that a switch to green renewable energy exported from the north of Europe to the south would remove reliance on Russian gas. Uh, and that uh, reality must now happen to provide that energy security. <laughs> Presiding officer, as we mark the one year anniversary of this horrific war, let us condemn Russians and this illegal war and stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. To them, we say from the Scottish Parliament, we may have no military equipment might to offer you, but we have the might of our care and compassion for the Ukrainian people in Scotland's homes and the might of belief that your culture matters and that your freedom is also our freedom. Thank you, Ms. Hislop. I now call Annie Wells to be followed by Bill Kidd for around six minutes. Ms. Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In my lifetime, I didn't expect to see a war in Europe like we have seen in Ukraine. I don't think any of us did. Russia stunned the world one year ago by invading Ukraine in a horrific act of aggression. Vladimir Putin expected to extinguish a democracy. He believed Russian forces would quickly overwhelm Ukraine. He thought their immense firepower would prove decisive, and he thought the spirit of the civilian population could be broken. President officer, how wrong he was. The people of Ukraine stood up in defiance against Russia's tyranny. They have fought so bravely for their freedom. Even in the face of horrendous atrocities, brutal violence against innocent children, and wicked acts beyond the usual horrors of war, Ukrainians stood firm. They refused to give in. Their valiant example has been an inspiration. Their courage runs from the top of the country to the ordinary people who have left their normal jobs and set aside their usual lives 
to pick up arms to stop Putin's army. President Zelensky has quickly become a fabled wartime hero, worthy of being spoken of in the same sphere as greats like Churchill and Montgomery. His speeches have rallied his own people and the nations of the world to help Ukraine. He will go down in history as a bold fighter for freedom. A strong leader who knew his people could defeat the odds, the valour of Uk Ukrainian fighters has been awe-inspiring to watch. But the tragedy unfolding on their streets is truly heartbreaking. War is always tragic, but the unnecessary, unprovoked and insufferable way this war has happened makes it far worse. People have had their lives turned upside down. They have lost loved ones and many have been murdered. Millions have fled and those who remain must contend with a lack of food, clean water, electricity. The devastation across towns and cities of Ukraine is hard to even put into words. The pictures are seared in our minds. But the resolve and resilience of Ukraine's people is remarkable. They don't give up, they have endured. Many have come to this country to start a new life, joining the many Ukrainians who already live in Scotland and the United Kingdom. Last year, one of those inspirational Ukrainians, Zenya Dove, joined us at Scottish Conservative Conference, delivering a powerful emotional speech. She recently told my team this. Many Ukrainians have been welcomed to Scotland with open arms, and we are deeply thankful for the Scottish hospitality shown to Ukraine for the kindness of your hearts. She continued, it is important to all of us to those still in Ukraine and to millions who were forced to flee their homes, because we are united as one by our belief in a brighter future and our victory. We carry this hope wherever we go because it's the cornerstone of our culture. It is equally important for those who are no longer with us, for entire generations who sacrificed their lives for our freedom and the right to proudly call ourselves Ukrainians today. Speaking at a launch of celebration of Ukrainian culture this evening, she will say that our songs are more powerful than the roar of air sirens. Our tales are more truthful than Russian propaganda. Our music calms us during wartime and our poetry inspires us to fight on. This is how we remain unbroken and undefeatable. I hope Scotland will continue to remain a place where Ukrainians are most welcome, and I hope that the United Kingdom continues to provide the outstanding support it has to President Zelensky and the people of Ukraine throughout this crisis. From the outbreak of war, the UK has been one of Ukraine's most staunch allies. The UK government delivered £2.3 billion of military support to Ukraine last year, which will be matched or increased this year. And that includes 10,800 anti-tank missiles, five air defence systems, 120 armoured vehicles, explosive drones and over 200,000 pieces of non-lethal military equipment. The UK has also helped by providing training to 11,000 Ukrainian troops run by around 1,050 UK service personnel. And another 20,000 Ukrainian troops are expected to be trained next year as well. For the civilian population, the UK has issued over 218,000 visas to help Ukrainians come to the UK, speeding up support for those fleeing the conflict. And more than £1.5 billion of economic and humanitarian support has also been provided to help the Ukrainian people, including loan guarantees to help keep Ukrainian public services running and around £220 million in humanitarian aid for basic necessities. And I also welcome the financial support given by the Scottish Government and the further £1 million today. On the other side, the UK has also led the way by installing tough sanctions against the Russian regime. On top of phasing out all energy imports from Russia, the Government has imposed the largest and most severe package of sanctions that Russia has ever seen, with over 1,400 individuals and entities sanctioned and £275 billion of assets frozen. 
I am proud of the UK Government's response and efforts of the people across Scotland who have welcomed Ukrainians into their homes and hearts. And the courageous reaction from the people of Ukraine has been an incredible inspiration. But this tragic war has come at a terrible cost. We can only hope it will end soon with a crushing defeat for Russia and Vladimir Putin. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mills. Uh, could I encourage those in the public gallery to resist the temptation to participate, and that includes uh, applauding, uh, please. Um, I now call Bill Kidd to be followed by Carol Mochan for in six minutes. Mr Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, <clears throat> today, we contribute to this debate as an act of solidarity with the people of Ukraine. This includes those living on the war front and the millions displaced abroad and the thousands of whom have found refuge in Scotland. This time last year, on the eve of what would become Russia's full-scale invasion into Ukraine, we could not have predicted the atrocious actions of the Russian army against the people of Ukraine that has followed. Once war broke out, it quickly became clear that Putin had underestimated the strength and the resolve of the Ukrainian people to fight for and maintain their sovereignty and freedom. Putin found his forces could not force the surrender of Ukraine, and so, as we mark the one-year anniversary of the invasion, the war continues. As world leaders marked the anniversary this week, we witness um, renewed commitment to Ukraine in various military and humanitarian forms, with notable support from other former Soviet countries and ex-satellite states, including the Bucharest Nine. They hold special solidarity with Ukraine in maintaining their sovereignty as independent states. Appallingly, Putin commemorated the one-year anniversary by delivering an address that displaced responsibility for his invasion into Ukraine onto the West, claiming Russia is protecting Ukraine. Over the course of his speech, the Russian military bombed civilian areas of Kherson, including a pharmacy and a nursery. Alongside this, Putin increased his nuclear escalatory rhetoric by announcing Russia's decision to suspend participation in the New START Treaty. This treaty restricts the number of nuclear weapons that can be deployed in long-range missiles based on land or sea reaching Russia or the US within 30 minutes. It also requires mutual reporting of the number of nuclear-ready missiles. As co-president of PNND Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, I presented a statement to the United Nations 10th Review Conference. In this, PNND called on the NPT state parties, including Russia and the US, to adopt a no-first-use nuclear weapons policy. I remain committed to this recommendation and reassert its increasing importance as we reach the one-year anniversary of the invasion into Ukraine. In the relatively short history of the existence of nuclear weapons, there have been a number of occasions where the world has come too close to nuclear war. Most notable of these instances was, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis. It is often at these moments, on the brink of nuclear escalation, when nuclear powers have peered over the cliff edge of nuclear confrontation and foreseen the outcome that nobody wants since the outbreak of war both nuclear powers, the US and Russia, who together hold 90 per cent of the world's nuclear weapons, have articulated this position that nuclear war is an outcome that nobody wants. However, President Putin has not actually acted in that direction. I anticipate that suspension of the new START treaty is nuclear posturing. It is nonetheless a worrisome and significant development in Putin's escalation of nuclear rhetoric. However, there remains opportunity to de-escalate inflammatory nuclear rhetoric and move back to a realistic negotiating table where nuclear weapons can dis be discussed and the merits of a no-first-use no policy. This, I believe, is, the, is in the best interests of countries around the world, and we must therefore keep UN channels open for these talks to commence. I also note that the NPT's 10th review conference failed to reach agreement of all parties as Russia's withdrawal from Uk Ukrainian nuclear power stations was unacceptable to Russian diplomats. I have suggested to the High Commissioner for Diplomat Disarmament Affairs at the UN the idea of blue helmets being positioned in Ukraine to create a safety zone around nuclear power stations. 
Presiding officer, there are unfortunate indications of possible strategic escalation of conventional war. Putin's address on Tuesday doubled down on attempts to legitimise expansionist action. This week it was announced that the Kremlin revoked a 2012 decree that committed Russia to seek to resolve the separatist issues of Transnistria on the basis of respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Republic of Moldova. This sounds incredibly similar to the Kremlin's attitude to Crimea before the 2014 coup and annexation of that area. The Kremlin went on to explain this revocation of its commitment to Moldova's sovereignty as ensuring the national interests of Russia in connection with the profound changes taking place in international relations. On top of this, Russia is holding joint naval exercises with China and South Africa in the South Indian Ocean. Whilst China has stated its intent to help Russia bring this war to an end through diplomatic routes, the timing of these joint naval exercises with the one-year anniversary makes the assertion difficult to believe. It is in the context, this context where our continued affirmation and support for Ukraine must be the rock-solid it can possibly be. On Tuesday evening, the Cross-Party Group on Human Trafficking and UN House Scotland hosted a roundtable looking at how we can best protect Ukrainians from exploitation, given the vulnerability of displaced Ukrainian refugees. We had a powerful statement by a displaced social work lecturer, Kate Bushko, who insightfully told us how freedom is fundamental to the Ukrainian people. And this she referenced the slogan of the 2014 Ukrainian revolution of dignity, which was, freedom is our religion. We cannot give up on Ukraine now. Rather, we must strengthen our resolve to help them in all ways possible and protect the fundamental right to a people's sovereignty, freedom and dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. And I call Carol Morkin to be followed by uh, Claire Adamson. Up to six minutes, Ms. Morkin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I begin by expressing my sincere condolences and solidarity with the families of all of those who have died or been gravely injured in this senseless war. Most of us in this chamber are fortunate enough to have never had to experience such brutality and horror. So anything I describe here can only come from a position of utmost respect for what these people have been through. No one should have to witness these atrocities or lose loved ones in the prime of their life, many of whom, I am afraid to say, are children. I cannot imagine the horrors of being a parent or a grandparent when the bombs are raining down from above. It is truly despicable and we must find a resolution that ends the conflict as soon as possible. Like so many others, I had hoped the days of all-out war in Europe may be behind us. A naive hope, perhaps, and one that we now may not realise for generations to come. But my hopes are not reality, and people who are in desperate need are asking for our help. I cannot cower from that responsibility and turn my back. After all, the freedom of our own country was in part secured due to the assistance of others, many of whom laid down their lives to protect us. Ukraine is simply asking for resources and assistance. We have the moral duty to respond. We must not forget that there were far too many who were complacent about the threat presented by Russia's invasion of the Crimea Peninsula back in 2014 believing that it would be limited and contained, that it would never cause us any problems, and that perhaps most hopefully it would not lead to further bloodshed. Sadly and perhaps inevitably, that has not been the case, and we cannot imagine that Russia will stop now. That would go against the most common sense. We have learned a lot since 2014 about the intentions of Putin and those who support him, and unfortunately, at times in the UK and its allies have allowed themselves to be outmanoeuvred by him, perhaps a consequence of having a Prime Minister too often obsessed with goings on in Downing Street or within their own party. But the point is, we cannot allow this to happen again. I have long opposed foreign intervention in the march to war, whether it be in Iraq or Afghanistan, 
Illegal and knee-jerking wars must be opposed when launched from home or elsewhere. It is clear that Russia's invasion of Ukraine meets this criteria, and that is why I stand with the Ukrainians in their fight against tyranny. Trade unionists and charities across Ukraine are often the best sources of reasoned opinion in any debate. They have called for us to assist those fighting Russia on the front line, and I believe we must commit ourselves to doing so. I can't pretend to be a military expert by any means, but I think of those on the ground are so clearly telling us they need particular equipment in order to protect towns, villages and cities from attack, then we must take that seriously and heed their call. We also must continue to offer asylum and assistance to those fleeing from the war and offer a stable and nourishing home for those who are already here. There are many Ukrainian refugees in my region and across Scotland who could not have imagined only a year ago that they went, would end up somewhere like Dumellington or Kilmarnock. But they have and they have been welcomed and I hope that they can build a life here for as long as they wish to. I can barely begin to imagine what that, that must have been like, the worries they must have had day after day. They must continue to be our primary focus for this Scottish Parliament during a time when far too many other issues are dominating the headlines that, frankly, if you think about it, are little import importance in comparison. In concluding, Presiding Officer, I commend the motion and thank Neil Gray for bringing it to the Parliament. I offer my full support and am committed to supporting the people of Ukraine. Their fight is our fight. We must strive for peace and we cannot achieve that by allowing Ukraine to fall into the hands of a dictator like Putin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms. Mochen. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Megan Gallagher uh, up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. No one in this chamber wanted to mark this milestone. One year since Putin's illegal invasion on Ukrainian sovereignty. Though that we are marking it as a testament to the resilience of the Ukrainian people in the face of unprovoked barbarism, but oh how we wish we could be marking the end of the conflict. I have spoken many times on Ukraine in this parliament. Um, most recently in 2018, when we marked Hol Holodomor Remembrance Day, a collective reflection from this chamber on the Holodomor genocide. Can I thank my colleague Jenny Minto for bringing her important members' debate last night on the special tribunal on the Ukraine. I hope when we do so, we also revisit and the UK identifies the Holodomor as a genocide, as many countries like Canada have. That systematic man-made famine perpetrated by the Stalinist regime in an attempt to crush Ukrainian identity and erase the community of people it perceived as a threat. But the Ukrainian people endured. They endured in the face of that extreme oppression. And it is no surprise that they have resisted Putin till today. When war broke out last year, I recall Philip O'Brien. Professor of Strategic Studies at the University of St Andrews. He was probably a lone voice in saying that, in his view, this would be a war of attrition, that the Ukrainian people would resist and the conflict would be drawn out. He was almost a lone voice. And just as he has been right, we have had to adjust our response, which has mainly been humanitarian, to one of long-term support rather than short-term immediate support. The super sponsor scheme has supplied much needed route to sanctuary for tens of thousands of vulnerable people. More than 23,000 Ukrainians have arrived in Scotland. The UK government's military support for the Ukraine has been considerable, but I would reiterate its calls for humanitarian support to be sustained and that devolved local administrations need to have a year two funding and not a reduced tariff, as is planned in January. And therefore, we need more support for the Ukrainians we are supporting in this country. Last summer, 
I was privileged to host the Ukrainian Cultural Leadership Dialogue at Edinburgh's International Culture Summit. The event brought together political and cultural leaders from the countries who wish to strengthen Ukraine's international standing and support their institutions at this time. I also attended the very moving Postcards from Ukraine event in the Parliament, and it drove home the reality of what Ukrainians are facing. And as a picture paints a thousand words, we saw images such as the Kostyan Tenevka Mosque, the Church of the Ascension of the Lord, Kharkiv National Ac Academic Opera and Ballet Theatre, and even the memorial to the victims of totalitarianism. It was so moving and so profound, and I urge everyone to see it. And I've broken the prop rule, presiding officer. I will also encourage people to look to the Usher Hall on Sunday night for the Salute Ukraine concert, which brings together Scotland's culture and that of the, U the Ukrainian people in support of the, their, their challenges at this time. I have been very fortunate to connect with Ukrainians in my mother and Wisha constituency. Our community has shown its spirit and the Ukrainian families should know they are very welcome. And also I have made links with some of the people on the ship due to my committee roles. The importance of these links, these friendships cannot be overstated. And the cultural connections are essential expressions of our country's solidarity with the people of the Ukraine. I thank the presiding officer for her ongoing work to ensure this parliament stands in unity with Ukraine and Oberig's stirring rendition of the Ukrainian national anthem in our parliament was a timely reminder of that resolve in the face of oppression. I was pretty moved at Murrayfield a few weeks ago at my own national anthem, but I will never forget the atmosphere in our parliament the other evening when that beautiful choir sang their cultural folk songs, but specifically the national anthem. And when I reflect on the words of that na national anthem, I think that it expresses everything we need to know about the people of Ukraine. Ukraine's glory has not perished, nor her freedom. Upon us, brother Ukrainians, fate shall smile once more. Our enemies will vanish like dew the morning sun, and we too shall rule brothers in a free land of our own. Slavy. Thank you, Ms Adamson. I think we can suspend the prop rule just this uh, once. Uh, call Megan Gallagher to be followed by Ross Greer. In six minutes, Ms Gallagher. Thank you, presiding officer. Tomorrow marks a very sombre occasion. It is exactly one year since the invasion of Ukraine began. The 24th of February 2022 has become another day which will live in infamy. It was on this day that we first became aware of the tragedy that was unfolding in Europe. News of the invasion was instantly beamed across our television stations, radio airwaves and on our social media channels. The shocking reality of the way in which wars are reported in our area makes it very real and very accessible reality to which we all bear witness. Even still, the decision taken by Vladimir Putin to declare war on Ukraine sent shockwaves throughout the world. Putin's remarks were carefully orchestrated and stage managed from Moscow with the sole intention of usurping large swathes of Ukrainian territory. It was deliberate action and has dangerous consequences for the general peace and security of Europe. Presiding officer, we all know that war comes with a very real and very human cost. I was roughly six months pregnant when I turned on the news to see a wounded pregnant woman being carried in a stretcher. The maternity hospital in Mariupol had been bombed and the wounded woman held onto her bloodied left abdomen as emergency workers carried her through the rubble. I watched on in horror as videos showed the devastation caused by the bombs and all I could think about was the women and newborn babies who were in the building the moment the hospital was attacked. I later learned that the woman who was carried through the rubble and was taken to another hospital where the doctors tried to save her and her baby, but they both didn't make it. The Russian military of defence claimed that the bombing of the hospital was justified by the presence of Ukrainian armed forces. 
bombing innocent women and children can never be justified. It was a war crime and they knew it. Even now, I can't get the image of the woman holding her unborn baby and whose lives were truly ended that day. And, presiding officer, I don't think many of us will ever truly understand the horror of the Ukraine war. As my party spokesperson for children and young people, it would be remiss of me not to mention the devastating impact this war is having on the lives of Ukrainian children. A recent report in The Telegraph highlighted the horrendous reality for those attending school in Ukraine. Over 4.7 over million children are enrolled to attend lessons. Those lessons are being interrupted by air raid sirens instead of school bells. Those lessons are being interrupted by power outages. Those lessons are being interrupted by fear and trauma instead of safety and learning. It cannot be right that these young people are seeing this as their new normal when it comes to their education and their lives. Even more concerning is the news that has come out recently from a Yale University report. The report has indicated that more than 6,000 Ukrainian children are being sent to camps specifically designed to expose them to Russian propaganda and orchestrating forced adoptions into Russian families. In fact, Ukraine's National Information Bureau claims that the number of children deported to Russia could be more than 16,000. President Officer, this has a point. The removal of protected people is prohibited under Article 49 of the Geneva Convention. Furthermore, Article 50 is as it's also prohibited to change the personal circumstances of any child, including changing their nationality. We, cannot, we simply cannot allow Russian aggression to define a new normality for the experiences of Ukrainian children. Therefore, I hope that members of this chamber and our colleagues at Westminster and across other devolved governments will condemn this practice in the strongest possible terms. Ukrainian children must not be forcibly removed from their families. And just like the story I shared earlier, it is important that we pause and reflect that almost 1,000 Ukrainian children have been killed or injured because of this war. That is a travesty, and our thoughts and prayers are with those who have lost a child during this conflict. By all accounts, this conflict is beginning to pick up pace again as we move out of the harsh winter months in Ukraine. We must continue to do all that we can to support the people of Ukraine as they continue to defend their freedoms. President Zelensky stated that the United Kingdom is marching with us towards the most important victory of our lifetime. It will be a victory over the very idea of war. What a wonderful concept that would be for all of us to embrace. A world without suffering, a world without conflict, a world where children of tomorrow will not come to accept the ravages of war as being their new normality. And as our most for famous wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill said, the salvation of the common people of every race and every land from war and servitude must be established on solid foundations. Presiding officer, that is an outcome that we can all hope and pray for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. I now call Ross Greer to be followed by Paul O'Kane. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When we came together for an emergency debate a year ago tomorrow, a 40 mile long convoy of Russian troops had crossed the Belarusian border and was headed for Kyiv. Hostomil Airport, just outside the city, was under attack by Russian airborne troops as we spoke. It was abundantly clear to all of us that the Ukrainian capital and government could fall in a matter of days. We watched the footage and saw the photos of the residents of Kyiv, civilians, preparing to fight a desperate last stand with homemade Molotov cocktails against one of the largest militaries on earth. 18-year-old high school students were being handed rifles and given hasty instructions on how to defend the neighbourhoods they'd grown up in. President Zelensky was being offered evacuation by the Americans with the prospect of setting up a government in exile. His answer was that he needed ammunition, not a ride. The weeks that followed were horrific, but Kyiv didn't fall. That massive Russian convoy collapsed and retreated, and it became clear that Putin's fantasies of a swift victory would not be realised. As the Russians withdrew, the horrors that they had inflicted on Ukrainian civilians became clear. The mayor of Hostomo, Yuri Prolutko, was murdered by Russian soldiers while delivering food and medicine to residents. His body was then booby-trapped, almost killing the priest who came to bury him. In Bukha, north of Kyiv, Izium, in the east and other towns across liberated areas, torture chambers and mass graves have been discovered. 
in still-occupied Starovsk, a local nurse, Tetiana Madreko, was executed by hanging in the town square by collaborators. Her crime was telling the Russian occupiers that Skodovsk was and would remain part of Ukraine. The past year has been horrific for the people of Ukraine. They have endured trauma that we can scarcely imagine, but they have not given in. The Kremlin's plan was for Ukrainian independence to end in 2022, after a three-day invasion. That plan failed. It failed at Hostomol Airport, where 300 Ukrainian National Guardsmen routed Putin's elite airborne troops. It failed in Kherson, from where we saw the amazing footage last November of Ukrainian soldiers being greeted by cheering, crying crowds as they re-entered the city. And it failed in Mariupol, a city almost completely destroyed and still under Russian occupation today, but whose defenders fought one of the most effective defensive operations in modern urban warfare. Without any chance of winning that battle, Ukrainian soldiers and police officers fought on for nearly three months, making their final stand at the Azovstal steel plant. That effort held up Russian divisions many times their size and undoubtedly saved other towns and cities across the south from a similar fate. The Ukrainian defenders at Mariupol included the Azov Battalion, who I mentioned in my contribution this time last year. The Azov Battalion was founded by neo-Nazis. And whilst it's a very different organisation, years after having been integrated into the Ukrainian army, there is still a fascist presence. It's uncomfortable to see soldiers of a nation whose struggle we absolutely support doing interviews in Western media while wearing fascist iconography like the Black Sun. I'm glad that NATO removed their promotional photo of a Ukrainian soldier whose uniform prominently featured that icon. That's not remotely close to the most important issue in this war, and raising it shouldn't be seen for a second as a lack of support for Ukraine's struggle. As somebody on the Kremlin sanctions list, I hope that no one would accuse me of that. But as a key supporter of Ukraine, the UK has a responsibility to speak some truth to our ally, especially when Russia is pushing the utterly disingenuous nonsense of neo-Nazi influence as justification for their wicked invasion. I would hope that no one here would tolerate British soldiers wearing that kind of iconography, so we should help those that we are arming to similarly make clear that it is unacceptable for their own troops. Nonsense claims about the influence of the Azov Battalion are being used by Putin's useful idiots here and elsewhere to undermine public support for Ukraine. And given how long this war is sadly likely to last, we cannot give an inch to those seeking to undermine our solidarity. Those same useful idiots often disingenuously claim that some kind of compromise needs reached, pretending that their only interest is in a peaceful end to the war. But what would that compromise look like? Compromise implies giving Russia something it didn't have a year ago, something it could walk away with. The Ukrainians have rightly made clear that they will not cede an inch of their territory to an invading power. And what right do outside players have to tell Ukrainian citizens that the price of peace is they are continuing to live under an occupying force which tortures and massacres them, which hangs civilian protesters in town squares? Peace is the absence of violence and the presence of justice. There would be neither of those for Ukrainians living under Russian occupation. Beyond supplying the equipment needed by Ukraine's armed forces, which the Scottish Greens support, European nations must step up our sanctions efforts and dramatically speed up our transition away from fossil fuels, robbing Putin of the geopolitical weapon that he has wielded for 20 years. The UK may have only sourced a very small fraction of our gas from Russia before this war, but companies here have played a key role in supporting Russia's oil and gas sector. I hope that others were as horrified as I was by the revelation that Scottish-based Baker Hughes continued shipping equipment to Russia as late as June, months after the war began. And I welcome the Deputy First Minister's robust response to my request that the Scottish Government withhold grant support to a company still contributing, however indirectly, to the Russian war machine. The people of Scotland should be proud of the solidarity shown to our Ukrainian friends. We have welcomed a number of Ukrainian refugees far in excess of our share of the UK population. Huge sums of money and tons of supplies have been collected here. And the Scottish Government is straining its limited powers in this area to make the sanctions and economic pressure on Russia as effective as possible. It's easy for us to take freedom for granted. There's been no serious threat to our own for decades here. But 30 years after the end of the Cold War and what was then claimed by some to be the irreversible forward march of democracy, we can see on our own continent how fragile freedom really is. However peripheral our role is, history will judge all of us on what we did to defend freedom in Ukraine. This afternoon, we will unanimously declare once again that Scotland's role is to stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people and to do all within our power to aid their victory. Slava Ukraini.
Thank you, Mr. Breer. I now call Paul O'Kane to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr. O'Kane. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is difficult to comprehend that it has been one year since Russia launched its illegal war of aggression in Ukraine. And I think we will all remember that day, the sense of outrage and deep worry for the people of Ukraine, but also the sense of unity of purpose uh, as we gathered in this chamber to offer our solidarity to the Ukrainian people. And may I join colleagues in paying tribute to that sense of unity across Parliament and indeed to the work of the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for helping to foster that. We mourn those who have lost their lives and we pray for all those who have been victims in Russia's campaign of brutal and indiscriminate attacks. We have all seen evidence of the atrocities committed by the barbaric Russian regime uh, in towns and cities across Ukraine as they have indiscriminately bombed civilians and attacked Ukraine's critical infrastructure. There is a clear sense of anger and injustice in what has been happening to Ukraine and its people. Uh, and I think uh, an outrage, as I have said already, in terms of Russia's decision to provoke a war that is an unjustifiable act of aggression. But here in Scotland, we have all witnessed uh, generous acts of solidarity as our villages and towns have rallied to support Ukraine. In March last year, in the early days of the war, the Deanston Bakery in the south side of Glasgow, open, owned by Ukrainian baker um, Yuri Kashak, organised a bake sale to raise funds uh, to support people in his homeland. The response was overwhelming. From across the west of Scotland, people travelled and formed a queue which snaked around the blocks of tenement flats as he willingly waited for over an hour to donate and support to Ukraine. In total, Yuri raised a staggering total of £25,000 from that bake sale. And the money was supported by funds raised through a Just Giving page started by the bakery, increasing the total to over £36,000. This was then doubled by an incredibly generous anonymous donation, which brought the, to brought the total amount raised to £72,451, all of which was donated to the Disasters Emergency Committee Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal. I think this example is reflective of people in Scotland's response to the early days of the war. People felt powerless to stop the atrocities being committed by Russia, but they wanted to do something, anything, to express their solidarity and provide meaningful support to the, meaningful support to the people of Ukraine. And since the onset of Russia's war of aggression, Scotland has, of course, welcomed over 20,000 Ukrainian uh, people through the Super Sponsor and Homes for Ukraine scheme. And it is right that Scotland should remain their home for as long as they need it or as long as they wish to live here, because the war has altered their lives irreversibly. And that's why we must help provide displaced Ukrainians with stability and security and allow them to make Scotland not just a safe haven, but a place they can truly call home. In my region, in the west of Scotland, we have been pleased to welcome Ukrainian people to our communities. Indeed, hundreds of people are living on the cruise ship MS Ambition, which is birthed at King George V dock in Renfrew. This, of course, has provided much-needed safety, uh, but ultimately a cruise ship must only be a temporary solution, and it does not provide the security of tenure that people require. So, as we have heard already from colleagues, it is imperative that the government uh, must devise a longer-term strategy for housing displaced people from Ukraine, which will give them that certainty about their future and an opportunity to truly root their lives here in Scotland if they wish to do so. And that does mean the Scottish Government providing necessary funding to local government to allow them to meet the needs of the Ukrainian uh, diaspora population. But Ukrainians, uh, presiding officer, have become integral members of our communities. They are our neighbours, they are our friends. And I just want to share a few examples of how they have been welcomed in the communities I represent. In East Renfrewshire, the Park Parish Church in Gifnock opened their doors as a hub for newly settled Ukrainian families. Uh, providing free face-to-face -face English lessons and access to support services, which has allowed families to integrate more easily into the local community. In Inverclyde, pupils at Clydeview Academy in Guruk organised a variety of fundraising activities as they aimed to uh, provide Ukrainian refugees newly arrived in Inverclyde with bespoke welcome packs that made them feel at home in the area and told them something about the community and the rich history of Inverclyde in welcoming people uh, fleeing war and persecution. 
As the war in Ukraine enters its second year, it is important to state that this is an issue which is so much bigger and so much important than party politics. And I think we have seen that uh, across the chamber today. And it is why Labour have supported the approach of the UK government every step of the way. And we will continue to work constructively with both of our governments uh, at the UK and here in Scotland to maximise the resources and support we will provide to Ukraine. And like my colleagues, I was proud to see Keir Starmer visit Kyiv last week to express that solidarity uh, and show that willingness um, to continue to support the people of Ukraine, defend their sovereignty and their territorial integrity. In drawing to a conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I was heartened to hear uh, Donald Cameron quote the great Seamus Heaney in his contribution. And may I offer to the Chamber two further quotes today? Um, Seamus Heaney writes, if you have the words, there's always a chance you'll find the way. I hope that our words today in this chamber uh, have been helpful to the people of Ukraine, and together we will work to find the way through this. But Heaney also quotes um, from Beowulf when he says, anyone with gumption and a sharp mind will tell you, take the measure of two things, what's said and what's done. And I think that could apply perfectly to President Zelensky and the people of Ukraine. We are in awe of their words and of their actions. So now, presiding officer, may our actions match our words. Victory to Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Kane. <clears throat> and I now call Bob Doris, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Doris. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Russia's unprovoked and illegal war on Ukraine seemed unthinkable just over a year ago. Sabre rattling and rhetoric from Putin over Ukraine has been turned into a brutal and savage war waged on the people of Ukraine. But I suppose hindsight is a wonderful thing, given Russian actions in Crimea already, and deeds elsewhere in the world. Perhaps we should never have been surprised. There was a naivety there. Perhaps Russia has had no thoughts for the human cost no thoughts for the pain, suffering, destruction and death inflicted on the innocent people of Ukraine, or indeed for families in Russia who are seeing sons coming back in body bags. No respect for Ukraine's territorial integrity or their sovereignty, and no consideration for the potential destabilising impact on the entire world. I offer my solidarity for the people of Ukraine, and of course solidarity is just a word without a demonstration of that solidarity. So as we have heard across the chamber today, people opening their homes to Ukrainian families have demonstrated that solidarity here in Scotland. Fundraising and humanitarian support offered by ordinary Scots has demonstrated that solidarity. The financial support from the Scottish Government and the practical efforts of all public bodies and agencies such as councils, housing associations, the NHS and many others has demonstrated that solidarity. So here at home, now at home, at least for the time being, for as long as they wish it to be for so many Ukrainians in Scotland, we must always make sure solidarity remains more than a slogan, but a tangible action in our deeds every single day. And I'm confident that will absolutely remain the case. And let me provide some examples locally. Mention was made in the Minister's opening speech of young people going to schools. I have many in Scotland in making a success of that, and I have many examples in Glasgow and in my constituency. I have heard many positive stories of the assets those young people have been to the schools and communities from which they now live. And I was speaking to the head teacher of St Rock Secondary in my constituency, Mr Stone, and St Rock's in the Gargad, an area in some ways forged by immigrants and immigration, has done a wonderful job, pupils, staff and the wider community in making the young people from Ukraine warmly welcome and in offering young people quality educational opportunities. There are around 20 Ukrainian students there. Most of accommodation within communities, however, two senior school students currently reside on MS Ambition. Those two students are embedded into that school community. They have seized the opportunities open to them. I understand they will be sitting SQ exams in the months ahead. And they are also facing the disruption of being rehoused from MS Ambition just as they prepare for and set those said same exams. It is wholly unclear where they will end up, 
although I'm sure much good work is taking place to do the best we can for those families. But I very much hope that their families get accommodation that I know would be suitable for them and secure accommodation in Glasgow or nearby enough to let both students continue their studies at St Rocks, minimise disruption to their exams and allow them to retain friendships and relationships forged. That will be challenging, but we must absolutely try. I have contacted the relevant authorities about this, as well as the Minister and correspondence, and I would hope that such cases will be looked at sympathetically and the two students can stay at St Rocks, maintain those friendships, forged, build that solidarity. The other day I, I, I met a gentleman who I won't name, but he stays on MS Ambition with his wife and child. I met him by accident. He was trying to contact a local housing association, coincidentally co-located beside my office. He was, he, he'd found a job uh, locally at a business and been working there for some time. And he wished to ensure that he can retain that job when rehoused from MS Ambition. The gentleman was simply trying to secure a tenancy locally. And I have no doubt that securing such a tenancy locally would be much of a benefit for the business for which employs him as it would be for him and his family. And I have written a specific letter to the relevant authorities offering support for that gentleman and his family. Why do I mention those two very local examples here this afternoon? Well, I mention th those examples because solidarity isn't just the big things, the international context, the sweeping things we can do as parliaments and nations to show solidarity on the international stage. It's that day-to-day -day solidarity for those that have made Scotland their home through adversity. Whether it's the young people who have welcomed Ukrainian students into their community, or to those who have fundraised or opened up their homes, from the politicians in this place, across party, or to the wider Scottish population. The people of Ukraine have their hearts and they have their solidarity. Slava Ukraina. Thank you, Mr Doris. We will now move to closing speeches and I call on Voisel Chowdhury to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Around six minutes, please, Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like to express once again a warm welcome to the Ukrainian Council for joining us in Parliament today. Today, the Parliament has come together to stand in solidarity with Ukraine. I echo my colleagues' dismay over the innocent lives lost in the unjustified war and the, uh, and the courage and resol uh, resolve shown by the people of Ukraine. Over the last year of this illegal war, we have witnessed barbaric aggression and Putin has made it clear in the last few days there is no end to the horizon. We must remain steadfast in our support to Ukraine. As my colleagues have highlighted, we must continue to provide defensive military support to Ukraine and continue to increase economic and diplomatic pressure. As Sarah Boyack noted, sanctions are still crucial to Putin's pressure on the Russian regime. We must make it clear that Scotland will continue to support diplomatic means to end this war. Putin must feel the cost of this continued aggression against a sovereign nation. Still, we must remember the goal of de-escalation. The Russian regime aggression begins this war. We must support any diplomatic means possible to end it. Solidarity means commitment to Ukraine. We must remember that our efforts are first and foremost for the innocent people affected by Putin's war in Ukraine. Continued support must be given to those who have been and continue to, to be displaced by this war. As my colleague uh, Sarah Boyack rightfully put, we must take measures to ensure the safety of all refugees in Scotland and that they are protected against forces such as people, traffickers, that might abuse the crisis. Ukraine people must have a safe home here in Scotland. 
I would also like to express my thanks to the Minister Neil Gray uh, for keeping us all updated on the Scottish Government's effort to house displaced Ukrainians. I note the Minister's comment about Council and local authorities working with the Scottish Government on plans for long-term housing and resettlement of Ukrainian refugees. The local authorities in Edinburgh has previously approached me on the topic of support from the Scottish Government. I hope the Scottish Government can continue to work in partnership with the local authorities to continue to show solidarity to Ukrainians by, by housing as many Ukrainian people as possible. As my colleague uh, Donald Cameron uh, mentioned, we need to be prepared with a long-term strategy to house Ukrainian refugees and support their uh, integration into our, the society. Both the MS Ambition and in Glasgow and MS Victoria here in Edinburgh are set to disembark within the coming months. They are currently home to around 2,200 Ukrainian refugees. Neither Glasgow nor Edinburgh have the spare housing capacity to accommodate this. So there are fears that they will have to be re, uh, rehoused elsewhere. Many of these individuals have spent almost a year living in these ships. They have built relationships, communities, and lives in both Glasgow and Edinburgh. Now, it is possible that with the Ukrainian Longer Term Resettlement Fund, these individuals may be further displaced to unknown place in Scotland. A long-term housing strategy for these individuals is essential. One that support to protect the mental health of Ukrainian refugees that have been through trauma most of us can only imagine. They need to be able to put down roots. Their children need to go to school. They should be able to build their life here and call Scotland their home for as long as they need to. We welcome a long-term strategy for uh, the thousands of refugees that are likely to remain in Scotland for at least the next year. One that should be prepared to house them for much longer if Putin wars continues. This is how we can continue to show solidarity and support to Ukraine one year on from the beginning of this war. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chowdhury. I now call on Sharon Dowie to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Around seven minutes, please, Ms Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I also welcome the Ukrainian Consul to the Chamber. I'm pleased to bring this debate to a close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. It's been almost a year since Ukraine was forced to fight to protect its sovereignty, territorial integrity and freedom against the Russian aggressors. Our television screens have been flooded with images of the horrors since the very beginning. Images of a bombed theatre in Mariupol, where hundreds of children were sheltering despite a clear sign warning that there were children inside. Images of a missile attack at a rail station in Kramatorsk, where thousands of women and children were waiting to flee the Russian invasion. The horrific scenes of civilian carnage, mass graves and reports of rape and torture from towns like Butcha, Cherniv and Sumy. All these scenes are still fresh in our memories. Ukraine was forced into a war that it did not choose. But despite these tragic events, the Ukrainian people, led by President Volodymyr Zelensky, have displayed unbelievable levels of courage. I stand here today to reiterate my support for the heroic people of Ukraine. I know that road has not been easy, but I also know that Ukraine's spirit and determination have not wavered and that it will continue to fight for its freedom. Ukraine's fight is a just fight. Ukraine has the right to defend itself against foreign aggression and the international community stands firmly with Ukraine in its efforts to do so. 
The Russian President warned us away from involvement in Ukraine on the eve of the invasion. The international response denied Vladimir Putin what he wanted. Humanitarian aid continues to support the civilian population that has been suffering and military assistance has allowed the Ukrainian military to repel Russian aggressors on multiple fronts. Along with the United States, the United Kingdom played a leading role in driving the international response to Russia's illegal invasion. After the US, the UK is the second largest donor and it has committed £2.3 billion in military assistance to Ukraine in 2022, promising to match that amount in 2023. On the ground, Western high-tech military technology is making a difference. In addition, the UK is hosting Operation Interflex, a training programme with the support of several allies that aims to train 10,000 new and existing Ukrainian personnel in just 120 days. With military aid pouring in and sanctions spearheaded by Western democracies, Russia is now isolated more than ever. And this is a result of one man's dangerous ambitions, which have cut off Russia from the rest of the world. Ukraine's struggle is a struggle for the rule of law, democracy and human rights. It is a struggle against aggression, tyranny and dictatorship. We must remember the sacrifices that the Ukrainian people have made in this war. Thousands of soldiers have died or been wounded defending their country. Hundreds of thousands of civilians have been displaced and many have lost their homes, their businesses and their loved ones. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the UK and Scottish governments for collaborating together on many aspects of this crisis such as the sponsorship schemes for Ukrainian refugees fleeing a terrible war. I would also like to thank all sponsors who have generously offered their homes during an economically difficult period for our country. Third sector organisations, charities, local authorities, universities and many more have contributed significantly to the support of the Ukrainian people. The links between Scotland and Ukraine have a long history. Ukrainians first arrived in Scotland in the 1750s, with many studying at the universities in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Since then, we have strengthened these ties, as evidenced by Scotland's response today. I would like to highlight some of the points that have been raised across the Chamber today. So can I associate myself with the remarks of Donald Cameron, who rightly recognised the efforts of both the Scottish Government and UK governments to welcome Ukrainians fleeing the war to make their home here for the time being. Whether that was through the establishment of the UK-wide Homes for Ukraine scheme or through Scotland's Super Sponsor scheme, we have ensured that many Ukrainians could come to our country for as long as necessary. I was also pleased to hear my colleague Annie Wells quote the powerful words of the Ukrainian Scot Zenia Dove, who said, Many Ukrainians had been welcomed to Scotland with open arms. We are deeply thankful for the Scottish hospitality shown to Ukraine and for the kindness of your hearts. My colleague Megan Gallagher was right to highlight the horrendous reality for those attending school in Ukraine. Lessons interrupted by air raid sirens instead of school bells. It's not right that young people are seeing this as their new normal. Neil Gray mentioned that Putin's army has invaded a country in the United Nations. He mentioned the appalling atrocities committed and also the chilling comment the meat grinder is working but he also said about the continuing support from Scotland and I can also thank him for the announcement today that he made about the extra funding. Sarah Boyack said that we must support Ukraine in defence of their country and all members and all benches standing together as one to support the government motion today because we all support Ukraine. Alex Paul Hamilton spoke about the Ukrainian family that he has opened his home to and how they now join in in family events. Fiona Hislop spoke of the devastation to culture, the soul of Ukraine. Bill Kidd again mentioned the atrocious actions of the Russians, but how they underestimated the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Carol Malkin said what we all think, the need to find an end to the conflict as soon as possible. Claire Adamson spoke of the resilience of the Ukrainian people and also of her wish to end the war. Paul O'Kane 
spoke of the indiscriminate bombings of civilians and the outrage at Russia's, uh, Russia's act of aggression. He also spoke of the work done in his area to raise funds uh, to support Ukraine and also of the local Ukrainian baker who raised a phenomenal amount of money. Bob Doris spoke of Russia and how they had no thoughts for human cost or the pain and suffering inflicted in the people of Ukraine. And although she didn't speak in today's um, debate, I can also mention Jenny Minto, who last night had members' business on the Special Tribunal on Russian Aggression in Ukraine, and who gave a very, very powerful and moving speech last night. I was in the chamber for that, and also attended the Postcards in Ukraine event in Parliament, which again showed very moving images of Ukraine, which showed the vision of Ukraine before the war and what's happened since, since the Russia invaded. To conclude, Presiding Officer, may I say that in 2023, our support for Ukraine is as strong as it ever has been. The support from Scotland, the United Kingdom, the United States and other allies is unwavering. The heroic courage, resilience and determination of the Ukrainian people to repel the Russian invaders is crucial to defeating one man's dangerous ambitions. And I'll repeat what I said a year ago. We will support you and together we will defeat Putin. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Dowie. I now call on Angus Robertson, Cabinet Secretary, to wind up the debate on behalf of the Scottish Government. Around nine minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding uh, Officer. And it's been um, a very moving, a very unified debate that we've heard from all sides of the Chamber this afternoon, particularly redolent for me as the son of a war refugee who came to these shores 76 years ago. Uh, can I begin by reflecting on the contributions of others? So firstly to uh, Donald Cameron, who I thought made an, a very, very powerful and moving contribution this, this afternoon. Uh, he had very gracious words to say about the Scottish Government. I know that can't come easily at the best of times, but he was exceptionally gracious about the Scottish Government in general and to my ministerial colleague, Neil Gray, uh, in particular. So it gives me the rare opportunity in return uh, to praise the UK Government's commitment to providing... Uh, the weapons that are needed by Ukraine and by providing the training for Ukrainian uh, personnel. And I take the opportunity in particular to mention in dispatches uh, the Defence Secretary and former member of the Scottish Parliament, Ben Wallace, in the role he is playing in that. Uh, to Sarah Boyack, who spoke of solidarity, praised the cross-party, cross-parliamentary uh, agreement that we've been hearing uh, on this issue, uh, for her welcome for additional support announced today, uh, which is targeted at, at winterisation, resilience and rebuilding in uh, Ukraine. Uh, how she underlined the constructive role of opposition in a democracy to go further and faster. And I uh, invite her to keep up the good work on that front. To Alex Cole Hamilton, he and other MSPs and Scottish Government ministers and thousands of people across Scotland who are hosting Ukrainians in their homes. He powerfully illustrated the human loss and the experience uh, of Russia's invasion, which we should remember didn't start last year. It started in 2014 with the invasion of Crimea, with the invasion of Donbass and the Luhansk uh, oblasts. Uh, to Fiona Hislop, I'd like to commend her long-standing commitment to Ukraine, as I do in particular to Stuart MacDonald MP. I note that she, uh, together with a, a number of us, uh, are sanctioned by the uh, Putin uh, regime. We wear that with a, as a badge of uh, honour. Uh, she also spoke of energy security that Scotland uh, and Northern Europe can help provide to continental Europe, and I hope this is something that we can develop an understanding of, because I think Scotland has a lot to offer as we move forward to developing our renewables and hydrogen potential in, in particular. And by name, I'd like to mention all other contributions to Annie Wells, Bill Kidd, Carol Mochan, Claire Adamson, Megan Gallagher, Ross Greer, Paul O'Kane, Bob Doris, Faisal Chowdhury, and, and Sharon Dowie. I think all contributions this afternoon have been exemplary. If the last year has shown us anything, it's shown that not only Scotland, but the whole of Europe and the West is united in supporting Ukraine's democracy, its sovereignty and its independence. It's been a year since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine began, and in that time we've witnessed the brutality of this unprovoked attack on a peaceful nation. This anniversary is a chance for us to stand united, as we are and reflect on the impact this past year has had on the people of Ukraine 
And I'm pleased to see the many events, the great many events, that have been organized both in this parliament and across the country to mark the one-year anniversary. The postcards from Ukraine photography exhibit displayed here in the Scottish Parliament highlights the devastating nature of the tax on both the Ukrainian people and the country's cultural heritage. In Scotland, we have shown this by welcoming displaced Ukrainians into our homes and communities. They are now our friends, they are our colleagues, they are our neighbours. And I've been pleased that people have come together across Scotland to find different ways to show their support for Ukraine this week. And we've seen a number of events taking place across the country to mark the anniversary. Over the past year, we've been able to show our support by providing financial and practical help from government and through the incredible generosity in our communities, be that through charitable donations or direct contributions to communities in Ukraine and neighbouring uh, countries. And as we look towards a Ukrainian victory, I think it is worth considering the opportunities of twinning between Scotland's villages, towns and cities as we help to rebuild Ukraine in the years uh, to come. When the time to show our support and solidarity came, we've offered it wholeheartedly. The warm Scottish welcome that we have provided has been a collective effort that we can all be proud of. I am proud that Scotland has welcomed over 23,000 arrivals from Ukraine in the last year and that over 19,000 of them have come through our super sponsor scheme. As this ugly full-scale war enters its second year, we cannot waver in our commitment. Instead, we must enhance our efforts and continue to do all that we can to support Ukraine and those who have been displaced. The additional £1 million that we have announced uh, today and has been welcomed from all quarters uh, in the Chamber will go directly to aid organisations supporting people on the ground in Ukraine. And as part of our ongoing solidarity with Ukraine in the coming weeks and months, our work to support displaced people from Ukraine settle well in Scotland will continue in earnest. Indeed, in a bid to ensure the longer-term sustainability of our super sponsor scheme, it was this government who initiated a full review of that scheme with results published in November last year. The interventions generated by this review range from clearer information and support to investment in social housing, testing alternatives to short-term accommodation such as modular housing and actions to reduce barriers to employment and the private rental sector. We continue to work closely with local authority matching teams to help support people into longer-term accommodation. And the scale of demand makes this a challenging process and is taking a huge collective effort to deliver. I will very briefly. Sarah Boyack. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would give a commitment to provide us an update on the conclusions of that report, particularly on issues like modular housing, coordination and actually delivering on the ground safe, secure housing. Cabinet Secretary. Happy to do, do so, and Neil Gray has already given that commit, commitment to committee. I do so again in the Chamber this afternoon. As mentioned in the opening remarks, in September last year we announced up to £50 million of capital investment to help bring empty properties back into use. And alongside this, we continue to recruit volunteer hosts and have launched a campaign to secure more hosts. We will continue to do all that we can to ensure that the people from Ukraine who come to Scotland are met with a warm welcome and a package of support that allows them to integrate into our communities and build a new life here. Our close working with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, local authorities in general and the third sector has been a key success factor and we will continue to work in partnership to deliver integrated services that have the dignity and respect for the Ukrainian people at their heart. As we've heard today, it is Scottish society and communities the length and breadth of Scotland who have the most to gain from the contributions and experience displaced people from Ukraine have to offer. Great societies are those that embrace immigration and integration and those that encompass the diversity of humanity within their fabric. Displaced people from Ukraine have already become a mainstay in our communities and have brought with them a wealth of experience in so many fields, from education and academia to health care and business management. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I want to ensure that we do all that we can to make displaced people from Ukraine feel welcome in our communities and to continue to recognize the contributions that they make. Let me now close by reiterating the sentiments previously offered on behalf of the Scottish Government. We remain clear that all Ukrainians who have made Scotland their temporary homes will be welcome for as long as they need. We stand with you. Slava Ukraini. Heroem Slava.
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on marking one year of war against Ukraine, and it is now time to move on to the next item of business. And I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. I would invite George Adam, Minister for Parliamentary Business, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and absolutely no problem with that. Moved. Thank you, Mr Adam. And the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. There are two questions to be put uh, as a result of today's business. The first question is that Motion 7997, in the name of Angus Robertson, on retained EU law, revocation and reform bill, UK legislation, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed, and the Parliament, uh, the, therefore, we will move to a vote, and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.